All around the world, and especially here in Hawaii, folks love the beach. But just under the surface of the water, there's a man-made plague decimating the reefs that protect these shorelines. We're in the midst of the third global coral bleaching, which could lead to the largest reef die-off in history, which is a terrifying red flag for our ecosystem. But at the University of Hawaii, one scientist thinks she's found a way to give coral a fighting chance. I'm Ryan Duffy, and this is Now What? Coral reefs are often described as the rainforests of the sea. They are massive, stunning structures that are home to a huge variety of sea life. But all around the world, they're in jeopardy due to a phenomenon known as coral bleaching. While coral reefs may represent only 1% of what's on the bottom of the ocean, they provide about 25%, a quarter, of the biodiversity in the oceans. They are tremendously important elements of this planet. Globally, wherever you find coral reefs, they provide shoreline protection. They provide the structure that allows coastal fisheries to exist. Especially here in Hawaii, they provide recreational activities for tourism. Corals are very long-lived organisms. In Hawaii, there are corals easily that are hundreds of years old, in other parts of the world, thousands of years old. So when we lose a 100 or 200-year-old coral, we're not gonna get that back really quickly. So coral's not only hugely important to the ocean ecosystem, for both the animals who live in it and the humans who live around it, it's also difficult to replace and regrow. And that's because coral is actually a pretty complex organism. Corals are a combination, a symbiosis of the coral animal and the microscopic algae that live inside their cells. When everything is good, the plants do their job. That is, they take energy from the sun, photosynthesize, and provide most of the coral's food source. When things aren't so good, the symbiosis falls apart. The algae are kicked out, and the corals are left bleached looking because the colored algae are now gone. The corals start to starve to death. If they don't recover within weeks or months, they will die. It's kind of amazing up close. Beth, a biology student at the university, offered us a closer look at some of the threatened coral. So this whiteness here is actually what people are referring to when they say coral bleaching. That's correct. And what, what causes that? Well, one of the main things right here in Hawaii is the sea temperature is rising. It's becoming too hot. And that's in Hawaii, but that's also, that's a global. We're that's the, across the globe. Coral reefs are locally impacted, and they are globally impacted by the actions of humans. We are undergoing global warming. Sea waters are heating up. And corals don't do well in elevated seawater temperatures. This is the third largest bleaching event to happen on a global scale. So this is a big deal. It's not something that's just happening here in our backyard, but across everyone's backyard. This comes into, well, how we get on top of this? Can corals keep up? Well, the answer is up till now, no. So if you spend just a couple minutes talking with Beth, someone who's super knowledgeable about this, you get a real sense of impact and the scale of this problem, but also of urgency and the fact that if something isn't done soon, we're gonna hit a point of no return. The coral bleaching that we're seeing is the canary in this big coal mine of planet Earth. When the corals die, the reef falls apart. There's no more structure or habitat for all of the other thousands of species that live on a coral reef. And there goes the base of the food chain. There goes coastal protection. There goes the fishery. And there goes the biodiversity of this planet. It's tough to overstate the impact of large-scale coral die-off. Coral reefs are the foundation of the ocean's food chain. Roughly half the fish the world eats make their homes around them, and hundreds of millions of people worldwide depend on them for food and their livelihoods. I wish we didn't have to do this project. That to me, would be the best possible case scenario. But we are here. We are at a place where there are very prominent coral reef scientists saying that reefs will be fundamentally altered and massively degraded by 2050. That is where we are. And if we don't do something, I think it's irresponsible. Dr. Ruth Gates is the director of the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, located on Coconut Island. 
This 29-acre island is recognized as the leading facility for coral research. And we came out here to see Ruth's controversial plan to save the coral reefs. Hey, Ruth. Hey, Ryan. How you doing? Great to meet you. Really Hi. nice to meet you, too. Sorry, the weather's not a bit better. That's all right. It doesn't really matter. We're going to go and see some corals underwater now. Cool. But we need to get you suited up. So we're about to head out with Dr. Gates and her team to go on a dive for some coral that will get extracted and brought back to the lab. We focus not on the individuals on the reef that are dying, but the individuals on the reef that are surviving. And this has been a, a conundrum for me since I first started my career. I would swim out on the reef and I'd see these corals, a stress would come along, and some corals would turn pale white and bleach, and individuals immediately next door would be dark brown and seemingly healthy. And the question is, why? Why do some survive conditions that clearly devastate others. This scientific curiosity about the comparative strength of corals led Ruth to a simple but potentially revolutionary idea. She would select the strongest survivors and train them in the lab to withstand even hotter temperatures, then breed them to create a new class of super coral. And the tests are going to be ran on, on both the bleach coral Absolutely. and the super coral. Absolutely. By comparing differences, you actually understand the essential nature of one versus the other. While some simple A-B testing sounds benign enough, the super coral experiments have irked some in the scientific community. They're classified as human-assisted evolution, and critics have expressed some trepidation about the unknown consequences that can result anytime humans start manipulating natural habitats. People are very concerned that what we're attempting to do is GMO. And I want to be absolutely clear that we are not doing GMO corals at all. We're doing what we've done in our food supply or with our pets for many, many years, selectively bred for the trait that we want, and in this case, the trait that we're breeding for, is enhanced environmental performance. So Ruth's lab is part stress test facility and part classroom, where her team is constantly monitoring and learning from ongoing coral analysis. So this is great. These are the corals we've just collected on the reef. And oh, okay. so we're starting to prep them now for our experiments. So we'll bring an individual from the reef into an experimental setting where we artificially expose them to warmer than normal waters. In essence, we induce a bleaching event, but we bring them back from the edge of death. And when they are now exposed to that same condition again, they are better able to withstand it. They don't bleach. What we're looking at here is a living coral. That's this little guy right here? Yes. No kidding. Oh, my god. It's incredible, isn't it? You can see this image here, lots of red. The dots that you can see are the mm -hmm. algae. But when the, the corals go completely white, you can see uh. Now the red is almost completely gone, but we now can see that there are actually some residual algae within. And that's actually great because it means that if the stress diminishes, those algae can potentially regrow from within and rebrown. We're trying to provision corals to be able to better withstand future. And if we can do that, then we can implant these super corals into a natural population, and they will naturally breed with the existing corals, and all of those corals will have a raised environmental performance. By simply putting on a wetsuit and getting to work, Ruth has become a bit of a rebel among her peers in the scientific community. People can look at something, agree, 95% of the way there and then spend the next five years debating the last 5%. That's right. And really, we all agree on the first 95. Should we do something? Yes, I think we all agree we should do something. What we should do is what we're debating. Right. And, and I would say there's probably no one solution that we should be pursuing. We should, we should do it all. I think the work that Ruth Gates and her colleagues are doing is really exciting. Hopefully, they can take what these survivors know, these surviving corals have, and put it to work in the short term and hopefully buy us some time into the future. Some people will say, this is too far. It is a step too far. And I would argue it's only a step too far because it's new. But let's recognize off the bat that we have to do something if we want to have corals in our future. <laughs>